24. Fruide Fondue. When he got back to his room, he was touched to find all his belongings put away, and in the bathroom his toothbrush and shaving things neatly arranged at one end of the glass shelf over the wash basin. At the other end was Vesper's toothbrush and one or two bottles and a jar of face cream. He glanced at the bottles and was surprised to see that one contained Nimbudal sleeping pills. Perhaps her nerves had been more shaken by the events at the villa than he had imagined. The bath had been filled for him, and there was a new flask of some expensive pine bath essence on a chair beside it with his towel. Vesper! he called. Yes? You really are the limit. You make me feel like an expensive gigolo. I was told to look after you. I'm only doing what I was told. Darling, the bath's absolutely right. Will you marry me? She snorted. You need a slave, not a wife. I want you. Well, I want my lobster and champagne, so hurry up. All right, all right, said Bond. He dried himself and dressed in a white shirt and dark blue slacks. He hoped that she would be dressed as simply, and he was pleased when, without knocking, she appeared in the doorway wearing a blue linen shirt which had faded to the color of her eyes and a dark red skirt in pleated cotton. I couldn't wait. I was famished. My room's over the kitchen and I've been tortured by the wonderful smells. He came over and put his arm round her. She took his hand and together they went downstairs and out onto the terrace where their table had been laid in the light cast by the empty dining room. The champagne which Bond had ordered on their arrival stood on a plated wine cooler beside their table, and Bond poured out two full glasses. Vesper busied herself with the delicious homemade liver pâté and helped them both to the crisp French bread and the thick square of deep yellow butter set in chips of ice. They looked at each other and drank deeply, and Bond filled their glasses again to the rim. While they ate, Bond told her of his bathe, and they talked of what they would do in the morning. All through the meal they left unspoken their feelings for each other, but in Vesper's eyes as much as in Bond's there was excited anticipation of the night. They let their hands and feet touch from time to time, as if to ease the tension in their bodies. When the lobster had come and gone, and the second bottle of champagne was half empty, and they had just ladled thick cream over their fraise de bois, Vesper gave a deep sigh of contentment. I'm behaving like a pig, she said happily. You always give me all the things I like best. I've never been so spoiled before, she gazed across the terrace at the moonlit bay. I wish I deserved it. Her voice had a wry undertone. What do you mean? asked Bond, surprised. Oh, I don't know. I suppose people get what they deserve, so perhaps I do deserve it. She looked at him and smiled, her eyes narrowed quizzically. You really don't know much about me, she said suddenly. Bond was surprised by the undertone of seriousness in her voice. Quite enough, he said, laughing. All I need until tomorrow and the next day and the next. You don't know much about me for the matter of that. He poured out more champagne. Vesper looked at him thoughtfully. People are islands, she said. They don't really touch. However close they are, they're really quite separate even if they've been married for fifty years. Bond thought with dismay that she must be going into a vin triste. Too much champagne had made her melancholy. But suddenly she gave a happy laugh. Don't look so worried, she leaned forward and put her hand over his. I was only being sentimental. Anyway, my island feels very close to your island tonight. She took a sip of champagne. Bond laughed, relieved. Let's join up and make a peninsula, he said. Now, directly we've finished the strawberries. No, she said, flirting. I must have coffee. And brandy, countered Bond. The small shadow had passed. The second small shadow. This too left a tiny question mark hanging in the air. It quickly dissolved as warmth and intimacy enclosed them again. When they had had their coffee and Bond was sipping his brandy, Vesper picked up her bag and came over and stood behind him. I'm tired, she said, resting a hand on his shoulder. He reached up and held it there, and they stayed motionless for a moment. She bent down and lightly brushed his hair with her lips. Then she was gone, and a few seconds later the light came on in her room. Bond smoked and waited until it had gone out. Then he followed her, pausing only to say goodnight to the proprietor and his wife, and thank them for the dinner. They exchanged compliments, and he went upstairs. It was only half past nine when he stepped into her room from the bathroom and closed the door behind him. The moonlight shone through the half-closed shutters and lapped at the secret shadows in the snow of her body on the broad bed. Bond awoke in his own room at dawn, and for a time he lay and stroked his memories. Then he got quietly out of bed, and in his pajama coat he crept past Vesper's door and out of the house to the beach. The sea was smooth and quiet in the sunrise. The small pink waves idly licked the sand. It was cold, but he took off his jacket and wandered naked along the edge of the sea to the point where he had bathed the evening before. Then he walked slowly and deliberately into the water until it was just below his chin. He took his feet off the bottom and sank, holding his nose with one hand and shutting his eyes, feeling the cold water comb his body and hair. The mirror of the bay was unbroken, except where it seemed a fish had jumped. Under the water he imagined the tranquil scene and wished that Vesper could just then come through the pines and be astonished to see him suddenly erupt from the empty seascape. When after a full minute he came to the surface in a froth of spray, he was disappointed. There was no one in sight. For a time he swam and drifted, and then when the sun seemed hot enough, he came into the beach and lay on his back and reveled in the body which the night had given back to him. As on the evening before, he stared up into the empty sky and saw the same answer there. 
After a while, he rose and walked back slowly along the beach to his pajama coat. That day, he would ask Vesper to marry him. He was quite certain. It was only a question of choosing the right moment.